We did not inherit the wildlife from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Vern Ross, the executive director of the Wildlife for Everyone Endowment Foundation, is in studio next on For the Record. Commonwealth's attorneys and I have concluded that the NCAA sanctions were overreaching and unlawful. Someone's got the bubble product, and you and I as a consumer are going to want to buy. The country needs a comprehensive energy. Good morning and welcome to this edition of For the Record. Pleased to be joined by Vern Ross, the Executive Director of the Wildlife for Everyone Endowment Foundation. Mr. Ross, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. <clears throat> Looking forward to it. First off, to start off, tell us who and what the Wildlife for Everyone Foundation is. Well, the Wildlife Foundation, we started it back in 2005. <clears throat> and I came to State College in 2006. In the Wildlife Foundation, we raise a lot of money to do stream improvement work all across the state of Pennsylvania. Plus, we do a lot of habitat work for all the wildlife out there. You know, each of us live in, a, in our home. We're very comfortable. That's what we're trying to provide for the wildlife here in the state of Pennsylvania. Plus, we do a lot of educational programs for youngsters so the younger, youngsters understand what's taking place out there in Penn's Woods. We'll get to the youngsters in just a minute. You've been with the foundation since its inception. What's been the most rewarding moment? Probably my most rewarding moment has to be seedlings in the schools. And that's where we developed a program that each third grade student in the state of Pennsylvania has an opportunity to get a seedling from us. We pay for the entire program. Plus there's a lesson plan that goes along with it for the teacher to teach youngsters that <clears throat> uh, are forced to renewable resources because they've been taught, many of the kids have been told, don't ever cut a tree. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to educate them in a proper way of the forest practices, plus going out and planting a tree. Now, if I'm correct, the seedlings in the schools program, many of those seedlings are grown actually in the center region out at the Howard Nursery. That's correct. We, we do this in cooperation with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Uh, they provide the seedlings. We pay for all the shipping. Uh, we provide all the shipping of the seedlings plus the lesson plans that go to all the teachers. And it's free. I mean, all the schools, it's free for them. And that's actually open, that pro pro program through the state is actually open to anybody. But in the schools, there are, correct me if I'm wrong, one million seedlings now in the entire history of the program have been delivered. We're well over a million. <clears throat> I think this year we had around 171,000 or 172, right in that area. Uh, seedlings that went out to the different schools across the state of Pennsylvania, and it's a growing. Uh, when, I think the first year we had this, we only did like 30-some thousand, and then it started to grow and grow and grow. And every year we see a little bit of an upswing in the program. Now, obviously, you're very passionate about wildlife, and I'm sure you could tell me many stories about this next question, but where exactly does that passion come from? Well, i got to tell you, it comes from my mother and dad. My mother was a hunter, and when I was young, a youngster, I couldn't understand why other mothers didn't hunt. And, you know, you got to go way back into the 40s when I was born. And mom and dad went deer hunting. They went bear hunting. And uh, my mother looked like Annie Oakley to me, and I thought all mothers did that. But they instilled that passion into me. I just, it's like when I'm with my wife and we're going down a highway and I see a deer in the field, i got to pull over, get my binoculars out, and look at it. And she'll say, you've seen one deer, you've seen a million of them. But that's what makes my heart beat. There's just something about every time you see an animal out in the wild in its, in its natural habitat that just gets you excited. Oh, very much so. Now, this isn't your first post as a director in a wildlife organization. You've also spent time at the Pennsylvania Game Commission. How does your time there differ from your time here? It's like night and day, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, <clears throat> The responsibility is running an agency where you had 732 employees and about uh, 1,200 part-time employees. Where I came here, this is a more relaxed atmosphere. We know we're raising money for the right things, for the habitat and what have you. And we only have uh, two employees and me, and I'm part-time. And I just enjoy it. It's very uh, rewarding. Now, the way to raise the money, I noticed you have a project going on right now, the capital campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the capital campaign, we were going out, <clears throat> different businesses and what have you. We want to build a building here in, this, in State College. 
They will ho house all the biologists for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Right now they work out of their houses and around the different areas. This way they would be in one building where they could exchange ideas, plus we'd have a, a, a classroom there with TVs and screens and a whole bit where we can bring kids in and they could educate them because everybody's looking right now, how many coyotes do we have in the state? How many bear do we have? How many deer? Kids could get a lot of answers from this kind of information. And we're looking to do it right here in, in uh, State College because this is the center of the state. Now, what would that do for the budgets of, say, the Game Commission or the Fish and Boat Commission, that their scientists would be able to be housed in one single building if you could actually raise the money to get that building built? Well, what it's going to do, it's going to save them a lot of money because right now they all work out of their homes. You've got to pay them office uh, rent and what have you. But the other thing is they're all in one area. These are very intelligent people. They're sharp biologists where they... You have, like at the Game Commission, you have deer biologists, you have fur bear biologists, you have duck biologists. They could get together and exchange different ideas on how to do their job better and how to exchange different information. That seems like it would be a common sense <coughs> plan to house all your scientists in one area. Why in 2015 has that not yet happened from the state? Well, a lot of it has to do with money. You know, to build a building like we're looking at, you're looking at uh, eight, nine million dollars. And it's a lot of money to raise. And we went into this to raise this money. It's when we hit the big snag and a big downturn here in the United States. And that hurt us some. But we're ready to put together everything to start on it again. And we're looking to raise uh, six, seven million here in the next year and a half, two years. And that'll put you over the top to actually see this goal come to fruition. Right. And then we can start to break ground, get the building built, get the people in there. It's just like in that building, we'll have like an operating room <clears throat> where they can bring a, a, de a deer or a bear or an elk and do an necropsy on it. Then you'll have bleachers up where people can stand and watch what's going on and they'll explain exactly what they're doing, what they're looking at. Welcome back to For the Record. We are speaking with Vern Ross, Executive Director of the Wildlife for Everyone Foundation. And Mr. Ross, 99% of people love animals. They would do anything for animals, so they say. But it's one thing to love animals. It's another thing to step up and get involved, either with the checkbook or actually volunteering. What's the biggest issue you guys face in getting those people to take the next step? <clears throat> well, it is, it is a problem. And right now, probably our membership, we're up around 6,000 members. And to get those people, you know, a lot of people take a look. They all love wildlife. I'll go along with you there. But the biggest problem is, is they're in the comforts of their home. They love wildlife. But when it comes to putting some money forth, a lot of them just say, well, the guy next door will take care of it. And that's some of the problems that we have. Although I will tell you this, once we get them into what we're doing, a lot of them just can't, you know, they'll get a membership for $25 and next year they're giving us 100. Uh, it just, uh, uh, they love wildlife. They want to be part of it. They like stream improvement. They like clean water. We got the Right here in State College, we got the Tom Ridge wetlands, 137 acres of wetlands. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand what wetlands do. It purifies the water. And we're getting ready to do a, quite a bit of work out there so that the bird watchers can come in, the trout fishermen can go fishing, what have you. But everybody likes clean water. <clears throat> you know, when the last brook trout dies, man is not far behind. So it's very important to have clean water. It's very important to have the different types of habitats out there. Uh, bird watchers, <clears throat> we've got quite a few of them that join. Because a lot of people don't understand you have to have uh, high trees for a certain type of bird, uh, middle trees for another, and then low brushy stuff for other species of birds. And once you can accomplish this, it's great. It's like my dad always told me. If you're hunting somewhere, you don't hear any birds singing, you're hunting in the wrong place. 
You mentioned the brook trout and the stream reclamation. Half Moon Creek, that's one of the projects that you guys are undertaking right now. Yeah, <clears throat> the thing about Half Moon Creek, it's a tributary that runs into the Little Juniata and Spruce Creek. And those are pristine trout streams here in the state of Pennsylvania. We're doing some work up there. We're gonna be doing a lot of bank uh, restorations. We're doing a lot of uh, stream bank improvements. We're putting some uh, flash dams in and what have you to create more oxygen in the water. Uh, we're doing all kind of things up there uh, so that that water running into these pristine streams will be pristine when it runs in there also. And these are some of the projects that we undertake here in the state of Pennsylvania. Now you have about 20 of those projects are going on right now throughout the state. And I say throughout because there's projects upwards towards Erie. There's also a project in Northumberland County. There's projects down in the uh, Lancaster area as well, but many of them are in Center County. Why such a broad scope going from the Northwest corner almost all the way down to the Southeast? Well, we're a statewide organization. And being a statewide organization, you wanna make sure that you're trying to do the best you can in certain areas within the state. And you take a look at the stream projects that we have. A lot of these streams are impaired. Uh, I'll give you an example. Quaker one, Run was the first one we ever did. Quaker Run was nothing but acid mine drainage. And we went in and limestoned it and we did all kind of work up there. Today you can go trout fishing up there. That's what makes it all worthwhile. So being a statewide organization, we try to go across the state and make sure we, we get projects accomplished. The one word I picked up in your answer, you said the word impaired. That brings me to the Susquehanna River. We recently had John Arway on the show from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. He wants the Susquehanna River labeled impaired by the state. Do you think it should be labeled impaired? And how can people help out with actually fixing some of the problems that are on the lower Susquehanna? Well, I think when <clears throat> John Arway is quite a guy, he's a good friend of mine. And <clears throat> his biologists have been studying this for quite a while. I'm not a biologist. But when John tells me they caught a fish, a bass, that had cancer, there seems to be problems. And when you bass fish and you catch bass that got big black spots on them, there's something wrong. And there's, <clears throat> we need to take a good hard look at this because you don't want to lose a stream like the Susquehanna River to something that's affecting it. And I think people must get involved with this thing. They must look to... Uh, they need to help out with our legislators because that's where the bulk of the money will come from to clean up what needs to be cleaned up in that stream. And this is the way a lot of people can help talk to their legislators. If they lost the Susquehanna, you lose such a wildlife estuary, but that also drains into the Chesapeake Bay, which may be the best wildlife estuary in the country. Yeah. And it will affect all the wildlife up and down that entire stream, clean down into Maryland. Uh, the duck life, uh, any kind of the wildlife that uh, uses that particular stream. What's the worst impaired waterway that you've seen in the center region or maybe throughout the entire state of Pennsylvania? <clears throat> Probably one of the worst ones I've seen was over in Westmoreland County. <clears throat> and it was strictly mine drainage and coming out. And, you know, back <clears throat> in the early 1900s, my grandfather was a coal miner. And what they were doing was mining coal. They thought they were doing it for the right reasons for the country. And what ended up happening, there was a lot of damage done to our streams and lakes throughout the state. And when you take a look at where we were just 50 years ago to where we're at now, it's much improved. I mean, we work at it constantly every day to make sure that we can reclaim some of these streams that were damaged years ago. Yeah, I'm no stranger being from Schuylkill County to acid mine mine runoff. Do you think that the problem not only lies with the state legislator, but maybe the apathy of the general population to say, no, oh, well, it's just mine runoff. It's not affecting my water table. I think that's the way it used to be, <clears throat> but it's not that way anymore. Uh, give an example. When I'm up in uh, on the Elk Range, we have some real streams up there, Porcupine Run, which was really affected by the mine drainage. Well, now it's a big tourist attraction for the people who go up there to look at these elk. And when they're up there, they're saying, what can be done to clean up some of these streams up there? <clears throat> I think in the, back when I was a kid, back in the early 50s, uh, <clears throat> the apathy back then was, that's the way it is, that's the way it's always gonna be.
but that has changed. You are watching For the Record with Vern Ross, the Executive Director of the Wildlife for Everyone Foundation. Welcome back to For the Record, talking wildlife issues facing the state of Pennsylvania with Vern Ross, the Executive Director of the Wildlife for Everyone Endowment Foundation. Mr. Ross, early in the program, we talked about youth children getting involved. Mm -hmm. How important is it for them to get involved at such a young age? <clears throat> it's very, very important because that's when you start to develop your habits that last through your lifetime. In other words, uh, right now, if you take a look at kids, uh, they, they use the video games, the cell phones and what have you, uh, and they play baseball, soccer and what have you. But it's very important to get them involved in the great outdoors. Uh, because once they get out there, it's like my grandkids. <clears throat> I got them involved. They love it out there. I got granddaughters that I took turkey hunting this year, and they just thought that was the greatest thing. And I always tell the girls, if you want to meet guys, that's what you need to do. You need to go hunting. But uh, <clears throat> it's very important to get them involved. My grandsons, they all hunt. The one program that really interested me, because I have a hobby in photography, okay. the youth wetlands through a camera lens experience that took place at the aforementioned uh, Tom Ridge wetland area. We work with uh, Best Buy and we got some money and we got a bunch of cameras and we advertise them. We get youngsters out there in different age categories and they go in and through the and it's amazing what they photograph compared to what I would photograph and what a, what a kid sees through the lens of a camera is just amazing. <clears throat> some of the things that some of the pictures they have taken we put them on our website so people can see what these kids are doing and they come down there and they just have a great time we have gifts and prizes for them all and we've been doing this now for the last two years and we're going to continue on with it and it keeps growing every year and it's nice because the parents come with them and it's a nice day for the parents and the and the children to get together and it creates camaraderie because some of these kids get to know other kids from other school districts and what have you, and it's just great. You said it keeps growing every year. Another event, the sporting clay shoot out at Seven Springs, that was a milestone this year, the biggest ever. <clears throat> we had 111 people out there. And the first year we started, we had 38. So you can see how that has grown. And everybody that comes out there, they're there for one reason. Yes, they like to shoot sporting clays, but they want to support the foundation for the work that we're doing. And most of them get on our website and see some of the things that we are doing, and they say, well, we want to help support you. And that's what some of these uh, events we have, that's how we get a lot of people working with us. How impressed were you with some of the shots that were made that day? Well, I'll tell you what. When a guy shoots 100 birds and hits 100 clay birds, that's one heck of a good shot. Now, if it was me, I've never done it, to be honest with you. And if I would do it, if I could hit 20 of them, I'd be happy. But uh, some of these people come out there, and there was a lot of women out there shooting. Some of them were first-timers that came in, and they said they just loved it. And it's great camaraderie. They have a great time, and this is what it's all about. Now my dad used to take me shooting clay birds growing up. I'll honestly say I never hit one. And all the times I went, it was just, I was a strikeout every single time. It's kind of a running joke in my family. Now some of the other great events that you guys are hosting, the Fly, Fisher, Fly Fishing for Warriors project, as well as the uh, Gettysburg Lynx, which I must say is a phenomenal golf course myself. Yeah, if you go down to that gorse, golf course, <clears throat> the LPGA for the women have golf there. It's a very, it's a tough course, <clears throat> but if you're go going like on number nine, I'm not a golfer, don't get me wrong, but if you're on number nine going one way and number 10 comes, you don't see any other golfers. I mean, it's just totally amazing. And everybody that comes there says what a phenomenal golf course that is. And they'll ask me why I don't golf. I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. You paint your golf balls orange, you hit them, I'll shoot them. And, and that is such a perfect golf course for you guys to host your event at for what you do, which is wildlife, because it has 14 lakes on the course. There, there's water all over the place. And, and if you're planning on attending this year, bring more than three balls, because I guarantee that some are going to end up and you're not going to find them. The, uh, the Fly Fishing for the Warriors Classic, that's kind of a new event. W what is that? Okay, we're going to have that down in home waters. We work with Mike Harpster down there. And that's going to be a fly fishing tournament. 
and part of, a lot of the money is going to go towards, well, it's called Healing Waters, but it's Wounded Warriors. And we'll have some warriors down there that are being sponsored by some other fishermen that are sponsoring the event for them, that they will come and fish, and we will have personal guides to work with them. And that'll be held on Little Juniata River and Spruce Creek. And we're kind of excited about it because right now, uh, it seems like everybody's getting into the mix on this uh, fly fishing event, which takes place in September. And, uh, and we w I wanted to have it then because it's fairly cool and you don't have the real bad heat and humidity. And I'm a fly fisherman, I love to do it. I won't do it that day, I'll, I'll be with the, uh, the past veterans, uh, the veterans that show up. I'm a veteran myself, so I know what it all means. Now, I want to ask you to look a little bit into the crystal ball. What do you see might be the biggest problem coming down the pipe that will be facing wildlife in the state of Pennsylvania? <clears throat> well, I think one of the biggest problems we just touched on is the Susquehanna River. Uh, I just hate that we would lose all that's been invested within that river up and down the state of Pennsylvania because when you take a look at it, that water comes from quite a few different places in the state. Well, it starts up in New York. And to lose that, that's one of the best bass fisheries in the eastern part of the, the states. It would just be a shame that we can't do something about and correct that situation that we have there right now. And that's a real problem. If you could direct people to the website and how they could actually get involved with the Wildlife for Everyone Endowment Foundation. Yeah, they can just get on our website. It's Wildlife for Everyone. Uh, it's Wildlife for Everyone Endowment Foundation org, and <clears throat> they can get on there and look at some of the projects we're doing. They can see what we're doing, and there's the opportunity to, to join right there. You can log in, join, and I'll guarantee you when you join, we get it that day. Tomorrow morning, it's in the mail coming back your membership. Mr. Ross, thank you so much for being here. Well, I appreciate you inviting me. It was a great day. And thank you at home for watching this edition of WHBL's For the Record. Have a great day.